Yo. <laughs> uh, um, yo, what's up? <laughs> um, I'm La- Rebecca. Yeah, uh. that's Rebecca. Lago de Guate Peque. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I tried to introduce this video like three times or something <laughs> and we always get interrupted. So, but I guess today is gonna, or now it's gonna work or not because we... Maybe not, maybe not. But we're gonna make it work. <laughs> okay, fuck that. Um, <laughs> no, for real, like, uh, we're still in El Salvador and El Salvador is fucking amazing. I love this country. So does Rebecca. Love it. We're really stoked about it. And no, Rebecca is special, as I try to say, like... In a Unique. <laughs> yeah it, it, pretty unique uh no <laughs> for like specific. charismatic positive as fuck all the time and yeah that's why she's right now Thank here you. Thank and you. when i asked her yo is there something would you really love to talk about what you're really passionate about talking mm-hmm. the first thing was social justice mm-hmm. and feminism and so on yeah why yep. because that is what i'm passionate about it's what really brings out every emotion in me and it's something I care very deeply about from quite a young age I've always been interested in social aspects of life that's vague but social justice aspects of life but really for the last 10 years it's been yeah what really drives me and what shapes every decision that i make so i guess you're not just the person who's like talking about you're actively involved in making a change in that case right i try to yes every every action that i personally take is of course reflective of my own values and i try to be involved in larger organizations as well as much as i can Mm -hmm. um you mentioned it like today and uh, and a couple of days as well like that you worked for a non-profit organization or Mm -hmm. various non-profit organizations i Mm -hmm. guess right what what kind of like some of the yeah the first work that i had coming out of school or during school was working for a couple different environmental non-profits i started off as a fundraiser so i would go um go through neighborhoods and go door to door telling people about the work that the organization was doing and asking if they'd be willing to donate. Mm -hmm. And from there, I switched jobs to similar, but different in that I wasn't asking for money, but I was um, working on all the public outreach for a national environmental nonprofit. So again, working on various campaigns from oil pipelines to toxics in consumer products and it was all campaign specific so any engagement with the general public to do with that from petitioning to holding workshops to organizing speaker events um, or work to do with that and um, like i mean <laughs> that's something that i can tell from my own experience when i see people like on the streets or like in the city in general and you know making you know trying to make the majority of the people aware of some problems mm-hmm. and then like asking for some petition donation da, da, da. i always perceived it as a little bit frustrating for them because the majority says no i'm not interested at all it can be frustrating yeah. but one of the most important parts of the job is to not let it get to you yeah. to not take things personally you can't and all of us doing the work we completely empathize with everyone passing by no one likes to be bothered no one wants to necessarily stop and take the time Everyone, especially living in a big city, everyone is always rushing everywhere. And we ourselves get that. I don't like getting phone calls asking for money, but I, it needs to be done. And most nonprofits are fully funded by donations. And so it's just work that has to be done. But doing the work, it can be frustrating. I would say the more frustrating was when people wouldn't want to listen to what we'd be trying to tell them in that if they tell me they don't have time and they keep moving on that's fine but people who stop and then just want to argue but aren't aren't having a conversation with you they're just angry how, how is it for you in general like to accept other people's opinions doesn't matter how ridiculous they might be or sound because it's, if people lack of mm-hmm. empathy, for example, mm-hmm. um, I guess it's hard for them to understand like this whole social justice thing or like environmental mm-hmm. everything, you know? Like, how, Absolutely. How you- and it's, it's really challenging because it is personal. 
It's questioning your own choices. It's questioning the norms that you take for granted in a society. It's questioning the values that you hold. And it's deeply, deeply personal. And so it's understandable that people get upset because most people's reaction to a challenge like that is to get defensive. Mm -hmm. Everyone, most people react like that. But some people are better than others at acknowledging that reaction <laughs> and moving forward with it and just engaging in an, a conversation. Really being able to listen to the other person is is something that not a lot of people practice on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you do? I try to How? very much. And I'm not perfect in it at all. Up. How do I do it? Yeah. By actively listening. So rather than focusing on what I'm going to be saying next while someone is telling me something, I am focusing on what they are saying and really listening to it, not just trying to one-up them in a conversation, which oftentimes happens. You'll be telling a story and someone will be listening, but really they're just thinking about their own version of that story when it happened to them. Which is also <laughs> natural, I think. We, we, want to, we want to share our stories with others as well. I've been thinking about like when we were, you know, chilling together in the circles the last couple of days and everybody telling a specific story about their life. And I realized that people really, really honestly love to talk about themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone, well, not everyone, but the majority of people love to tell stories about themselves. Yeah. And it's also a skill to get people to tell those stories because not everyone will tell them when asked the first time. Yeah, that's right though. That's right. I mean I don't know if I created the space right now, but the next question will be what is your story? <laughs> My story. Yeah, if some if a stranger or if a guy like or whatever, the person that you like really feel connected to, but for just for looking at him or her, like the guy who just passed by, you know, like for everybody who's listening and watching, there was a guy from Argentina, he's literally shining, like blue eyes, and like, yeah, hola, <laughs> he's there, and this is like a guy, if he would ask me something, I would be like, I mean, of course, I'm always honest, or I try to be always honest, but I would not mind to tell him, like, really personal things, whatever, like, oh, yes. yeah, and, some people just have that persona and that energy around them is in itself a space so yeah a safe space so you feel comfortable talking to them exactly that their presence is already creating a space like it's just it, it's pretty ridiculous but it's possible but you know that's like well fuck I'm, I'm losing myself right now like i could just tell you like whatever like <laughs> no but for real like <laughs> am i creating a safe space for you <laughs> yeah you are definitely <laughs> um no but there are some people um yeah actually yeah whatever blah, blah, blah. i'm confused right now but it doesn't matter there was this the first morning i was, was here we were like just um sitting on a dock and watching the lake and i was swimming and i came back and i just, just sat next down to you and i told you something but i do like in the morning you know we're writing this writing down three thousand things blah, blah blah and that's something that i tell sometimes somebody but not necessarily all the time you know and in that case we're just sitting next to you and I felt completely comfortable. And that's like this, this ah, whatever. Thank you. No, <laughs> that's so good to hear. No, it is. Yeah, but that. Love to be that person. Good wife? Good wife. So, good about, only. so, what about your story? <laughs> My story. Well, born and raised in Zimbabwe. I lived there. I lived in Zimbabwe till I was 12. And then my family and I left because of the political economic situation. My parents made the really hard decision to leave because they thought if they didn't leave now then my brother and I would end up leaving when we were older because mm -hmm. of how few opportunities there are in Zimbabwe. And so they decided rather than that happening we would just all move together. Right now. So we went to South Africa and we lived there in Johannesburg for three years. Well, my dad and my mom, mostly my dad, were working on getting the 
visas to come to Canada. And then my dad went, lived in Canada for eight months and found himself a job in Toronto. And the rest of us followed. How was it for you, like the first time when you left, or the first time, the time when you left, <clears throat> when you left Zimbabwe to Johannesburg? I mean, you had your friends and everything there, like your whole home, mm -hmm. you're just living it. How is it like for a 12 year old child? Is it hard or you don't realize it at all? It was hard, but looking back, it's it was hard in kind of funny ways in say friends. And, and mm -hmm. of course I was, I was sad about leaving my friends. I don't think I really, really quite understood that it was a permanent change. Mm -hmm. it felt, I remember saying goodbye to all people and it felt just like a see you later, which of course it wasn't. Uh, but I remember being very sad and crying endlessly about leaving my dogs because I, I guess I knew I wasn't going to see them again. That's a, that's a real problem. <laughs> well, I miss them. But yeah, it was hard, but not not as hard as I might have thought. The move to Canada was harder for me because I was so much older. And so, yeah, I had the friends in South Africa, even though I hadn't known them as long and three years. And, so, and after I have quite strong relationships with people. So that was, that was harder leaving my friends there. Um, maybe to create the bridge from the first topic that we had in the beginning of the podcast, so true. <clears throat> Social justice and so on. And when I think about social justice, I think about racism as well. Did you experience racism from an early age? Like, not maybe just on your own, just did you see it? Like, did you realize that as a kid? Yes, because unlike in Canada and else, well, I can't speak about it elsewhere, but at least in Canada, racism is a very taboo topic. It is not talked about openly in Canada. With people. Yeah, I mean, it is in certain spaces, but okay. I say that because in Zimbabwe and, and more so in South Africa, because of the apartheid, talking and acknowledging, and, and it's just, it is acknowledged that it's part of the history and, and ongoing. Mm -hmm. It is the reality of the country and the people who live there that these racist structures exist. And it really feels that people are working within that, working within that knowledge that things are very broken, whether it be racism, sexism, and they're actively doing the work in order to improve that, versus in Canada, a lot of people <laughs> those problems don't exist anymore, <laughs> which is not helping to solve the underlying systemic issues. <laughs> And so, yes, I would explain yeah, so, yeah. yeah. because we learn about the apartheid, we learn about the genocide, we learn about colonialism, and we talk about what that means and how it, how it has shaped the society in, in South Africa to this day and the ongoing struggles that are happening and the ongoing work that is happening and the ongoing violence. And so I, was, I wouldn't say I was exposed to it, but that's the environment that I grew up in, knowing that that is the reality. And that, I'm kind of like, of course, you, you said it like in certain spaces in Canada, you're able to talk about it like, and so on, but uh, I was always thinking about Canada, that Canada is like a real, real tolerant, countries since they have like people from all over the world, like especially India and so on, da, 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 like a lot of immigrants. And so? Which is true, but it's also just very good marketing by Canada. Okay. It is, I live in Toronto, it is an incredibly multi, multicultural city, and there are people from all sorts of backgrounds there, but racism still very much exists. Mm -hmm. And even more so when you get out of the city. Just common trends. Anywhere you go, people in larger cities will be more liberal, more open minded because they're exposed to more cultures and more difference. There's more difference. You get to small towns and it's completely different. And the town I went to university in, well, it's a smaller town, about an hour and a half outside of the and People there are incredibly racist, a lot of them. And that's just outside of the city as well. Canada's history with indigenous people is absolutely horrendous and 
that's a good example to bring up in comparison again to South Africa because it is not acknowledged in Canada. It is not taught in schools. That people who live there don't know about the history. And it's, it basically means that all those same systems are still in place in Canada. And when it comes to racism or to talk about it or to acknowledge it, it just, it's not like that. Or it's like more, they're trying to deny it a little bit, I guess, right? Yes, yeah, like I said, it's a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. So, I, my circle of, of friends, I live in a somewhat more open-minded bubble no than most, you know, shocking. <laughs> so, it is talked about very much with people that I know, but the majority of people, as soon as I step outside my bubble, no one wants to talk about that. No one wants to bring up the difficulties that, that, cha that the challenges that that puts on themselves. And there's a lot of denial, especially around around Canada's history, uh, about the ongoing systemic racism in Canada. People just want to pretend that it doesn't exist. Yeah, um, I have the personal experiences in Austria. I grew up in a city, but all the rural areas are pretty race. Like, not everybody, of course, not a majority, da, 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 da. but there is a tendency that most of the people who live in the countryside are a little bit racist, like rural. They're, it's somehow that they're not tolerating all the cultures, or so like multicultural environments for some reason. And I'm always asking myself, how does this mindset arrives or how does it actually how is it able to stay stable over such a long period you know and that's i guess if you surround yourself just with these people who have this and you're not open to anything you're just completely narrow-minded you're not gonna let anybody else tell you anything different you know you're just not tolerating mm -hmm. but that's well it is it's, it's the exposure so you don't you've yeah. never met people from a certain culture you know nothing about that culture like any unknown, it's a little bit frightening. It's, kind of, it's, a, it's a very human reaction to have. I love you, empathy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the challenge then is to, is to realize your own biases and realize and question why you feel uncomfortable. Maybe question your question feeling uncomfortable and why that is. And that's what opening your mind helps. But if you've never had to do that, then then you haven't practiced that, and so it's very very difficult. I love I love that really that you have understanding in that case. Like for yes, yeah, if you're if you're not exposed to it, and da -da -da, it's some more lack of self reflection as well. But if you never had to do that, for like yourself, but actually you don't have. Actually, everybody has to reflect themselves, or I, or not has to, but you automatically come to the point when you reflect the actions, I guess, right? I don't know. I'd hope I don't know. <laughs> I would say so. I, I I, know maybe I'm a little bit intolerant. intolerant. Like there are a lot of there is one German rapper. His name is Blumio, and he had one song called "Hey Mr. Nazi." Uh, it was about Nazis in general, and because in Germany it's well presented, so you know, like not completely, but like, there are some scenes, you know. And he's the guy who's like uh, telling, yo, don't say in advance that all Nazis are bastards or something. Try to have a proper conversation for the, uh, with them and try to have understanding for them. Why do they think like this? And this guy is pretty empathetic and like, pretty understandable for that. Like at a certain level, I personally would not reach, you know, because I'm maybe, maybe I'm judging, but I just I'm saying just in advance, man, you're a fucking idiot if you're racist, you know, but in, it's yeah, it's it's very hard not to, and unfortunately, it is every single time. It's on the person who is feeling that oppression or feeling that injustice to kind of take a breath and do the emotional work of slowing down that conversation and, and trying to empathize, because otherwise, things just end up in an argument. Everyone is defensive, and people aren't willing to to listen when they're angry and defensive. But it's really hard. <laughs> it's hard to listen to someone talk about something that you don't agree with from every single core value that you hold, every single cell in your body. 
and to try to listen to it and acknowledge it and ask the right questions so that they themselves might start questioning it. You can't just tell someone they're wrong and expect them to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's totally right. That's totally right. But like you said, like when you face yourself in a situation with and racist, whatever, it's like just hard to control yourself sometimes. Yes. And in that case, I like to quote Bruce Lee because, because understanding goes along with patience, in my opinion. And he always said, like, regarding patience, patience is not passive, it is concentrated strength. It's up to you how you deal with people like you. And patience is in the end when you choose to understand. And okay, I just realized that I have to work in that. <laughs> Fuck. Man. It's hard. It's, it's not something you, you do just have to practice. And it's never going to happen all the time. I will lip out at people all the time. Because you really it's, do? It's emotion. Feeling such strong. <laughs> My version of living out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or what happens to me a lot is that I get so emotional about something that I just can't talk about it anymore. Which is also incredibly frustrating because if I can step away and take a moment and collect myself again, then I know exactly what I, I know exactly what I would have said in that situation to to keep that conversation open and, and actually question things and, and hopefully engage with the person. But in the moment I'm just too upset and too angry and I can't think of the words to say anything and I just have to leave the situation. The yeah, worst part about that is that most of the time people, the other person will likely just walk away and never think about the conversation again, whereas I'll still be thinking about it a year later. I still think about conversations or moments, instances that happened years ago where I was just unable to say anything. And but, but still in that case, what you could do like when you had this kind of situation and you weren't able to express yourself properly, you could still right now when you were thinking about it, like just call this person and write it. Yo, I've been thinking about this and I want to tell you that. Yeah. And I don't, not a similar situation, but that just reminds me of a personal thing. I was in a, in a high school that, that was full of really, really stupid kids, including myself as well. We were mocking the shit out of everybody, not just me. I've been mocked the first few years. I was always a fat nerd. And then I grew a little bit and I don't know, I started to play football and suddenly I, was, I wasn't that nerdy and da -da -da, whatever. And I started mocking other people, you know? And it came to some situations where I'm like, when I think about it right now, it's like, wow, what a monster. Have you been like 14 or 13, whatever? And that's what I actually want to say. Um, I've been thinking a year ago about the situation where I was mocking, just for words, um, another guy from my class. And we used to be friends sometimes, and sometimes I was mocking him because peer pressure, because other people mocked him. Da -da -da. And then there was a situation there was just, I was just sitting down, I, I texted him out of nowhere after I don't know how many years. Yo, I've been thinking and reflecting about our past, and I just want to say, tell you that I've been stupid as fuck. And I really feel sorry for the things that I did and just want to tell you that. And he just texted me, yo, man, no worries, really, I'm over that and everything. But I, you know. I'm sure it still meant so much to him to hear that. Still, still, of course, 100%, because, man, this leads me to another topic. There's this guy, his name is Nick Vujic. Have you ever heard about him? It's a guy from Serbia, but he grew up in Austria, uh, in, Austria in Australia. He has no limbs. Oh. Okay. Maybe you know his face. It's like he's pretty famous, I would say. He's a, he's working as a motivational speaker right now, and da da da. And it, I mean, it's amazing when a guy I didn't see in life, but I watched some videos. Imagine somebody without any limbs is telling you, "Yo, you have to accept yourself the way you are," and so on. And he did. He did. He has, even has a wife and and four kids right now. And he was talking about one topic: how words can kill. Because he got mocked as a kid. Uh, I mean, we're drifting apart. Whatever, um, how words can kill, and and that's something because we talked about denial in the beginning as well. Never underestimate the power of denial because if you get mocked as a kid in the beginning um, and you grow up, you kind of deny it. You not want to. You don't want to deal with it. And this can be the reason why certain diseases and everything, like stressful situations, arise like out of nowhere because you didn't um, close this chapter. That's like, and this is like. To maybe no, create absolutely. the bridge to create the bridge for racism as well when you get exposed to racism like like when you get when you suffer as a kid or, or as a human being in general like whatever um, and then 
suddenly it doesn't happen anymore for some years. But if you didn't reflect on this things that happened to you, if you deny them, then something is broken inside yourself, and you have to fix it. Like I'm, I'm losing myself. No, that's yeah, that's exactly what happens, and and most people who whatever it may be, um, they start to internalize that. And that's the most dangerous thing that words can do, is make so, someone believe believe the things that other people are telling them. Yeah. And just believe that that is true. Even if out loud they wouldn't say it, their actions and their behaviors are shaped by what those people say. Mm. And yeah, that's the energy words are far more powerful than we feel the right now. It is. Yeah. Huh. Man, everybody who's listening and watching, words can kill. Like, keep that in my mind, in your mind. Fuck. Man. There's a term for it, microaggressions. Micro what? Microaggressions. Microaggression? Aggression. Aggression. Yeah. It's, the term is used to discuss all the, the smaller instances that happen on a day to day basis for someone um, to do with whether it be racism, sexism anything to do with that it's those actions that if you were to just take the one example it doesn't sound like a big deal so to go back to your kids examples kids being bullied you know one time thing and you just kind of that's okay you can deal with it but when it's happening every day those tiny those small instances which on their own might not be life-changing yeah. over time and over multiple people yeah that builds up, and that is unfortunately what is yeah, most prevalent today. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah, yeah. And, and then not admitting it that it is like that. Yes. Like yeah. denying. That. <laughs> like what we were talking about with names last night. Yeah. We were talking about um, how a lot of people from different countries will will make a choice to fuck. Sometimes they make a choice, other times other people make a choice for them to change their name to a more English, Anglophone sounding name because people can't pronounce their name. That is a form of microaggression. Imagine being told that your name is too difficult to say and laughed at all the time, every day. It's, it's awful. And that is, yeah, that's just a good example of what a microaggression is. Um. Okay, got distracted. Thanks, Irish girl. <laughs> no, no, forget it. <laughs> um, but I guess in that case, um, in terms of names, when you're a kid, it's a certain level of microaggression. But when you get older, it's a brutal. Yeah, but that, that's so funny. Like, whoa, do you think that people from the very beginning are actually good or evil? Or I don't think neutral. anyone is born with evil. Yeah. It's also, I believe that it's very much to do with it. With their, with their story, with their context, with everything that has happened to them. People, every, every single action shapes someone into who they are in that present moment. And so if someone, I don't know, if someone is now perceived as evil, or someone is evil, that's because of their history. Yeah, all their surroundings and how I would say completely the same. I would always say that the human being is like a blank sheet of paper or a page in general, and then it's up to the environment. You get programmed a little bit by the parents, of course, by the parents at first, and by the family environment, and then yeah, when you social construct. Social but, but still, I guess um, you are going to arrive at a certain point when you can take a joystick and program or create your own character start like or not actually creating it to start reprogramming yourself because you're getting aware of some fucked up patterns that you have yeah. and then you're gonna like yeah re-solve yeah. re-edit reprogram whatever and it's work and you have to be willing to do that work which can be exhausting and it's an ongoing process always try to rewire your brain to act a certain way or hard it's very very difficult just changing a normal habit that you have yeah. that's like kind of and even, even from the very beginning, acknowledging your own biases to understand that, okay, I, I think this way, but why do I think that way? To do that work of questioning it, questioning your own 
assumptions is very difficult to do. And then, then it gets harder to try to actually to realize it in a moment and and make that realization change how you, your reaction to something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I guess. Uh, I guess in, in in I can speak at least for first world countries or for my generation or our generation that we grew up pretty open-minded and we are open-minded so in that case to have this understanding of the realize this thing okay i can do this and this with myself that's not the hard point but the hard point in our cases or at least i would speak for my country where i grew up first of all da -da -da, there is a certain level of laziness to get into some actions to change because you're like you grew up comfortable as fuck the only problems that you have were first world problems and then you're like ah this is something negative about my personality but yeah whatever because you were never exposed to take a shitload of actions from an early age so it's somehow hard to get into this real workload you know and that's gonna be the hard case and on the other hand if you grew up like just my, <laughs> uh, my opinion i don't know uh, when you grow up in a, I would say, narrow-minded um, environment, but you've been exposed to work all the time, or to, yeah, it could be just work. So you're into action, all, you're, you're more likely to do something, just to do without overthinking, yeah. what, a first world, uh, what a first world countries are doing all the time, overthinking, overthinking. So you have to find a balance, balance between like, okay, realizing this thing, and actually being practical and, yeah, changing, whatever, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's very true. You have people who seemingly would be so open-minded and, and, I don't know, not racist and whatever, good people, mm -hmm. but if they grew up in an environment where they haven't had to question their assumptions, then, then it can, those can be the hardest people to, to change, to bring about change within themselves. I'm just thinking like uh, and that's, that's what privilege is it's, it's exactly that it's that it's the opposite opposite of exposure but just it's those invisible benefits and advantages that we have that we just don't have to think about you get a point definitely well well good one that was good that was really good uh <laughs> no for um I'm just thinking like about an, about an actual racist, like if you, because if you're a racist, you're not that likely to come to this point of realization, I guess, or you think, yes, that you can change this thought pattern that you had, like, but not because, not, not because um, another person told you that this is wrong, just to conclude it on your own. Yes. You think that's possible? I think so, yeah? absolutely. It's something he's willing to do. Mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah, I don't know if most people are or not. And I think, I think what you said is absolutely true. That you, you can start that change by being exposed to what others are saying, but really you, you have to change yourself and you have to be willing to do that, which is really, really difficult. Yeah, just but if you keep keep it up, then then I absolutely believe that people can change. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just a matter of being honest to yourself, to admit certain weaknesses and strengths and patterns and blah blah blah. And in that case, I don't, I cannot generalize it because I really don't know many races because. Well, you probably do because yeah. maybe all do. of us are racist to some degree. Okay, we live ahead. in a racist society. And so we all hold we racist most? assumptions and racist biases. Um, like, Whether or not we act on those is very, very different. And, and again, bring back to those microaggressions that's often why those happen. So 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 Jet ski, of course. Okay. Anyway, so we all hold these. Yeah, we live in a racist society within a racist systemic, systemic racist culture. And we can't get out of that. But we can acknowledge it and change our own behaviors within that. So 
that you probably know a lot of racism because we all are to some degree, as I said. I myself, I, I know that sometimes my gut reaction to something or my assumption is deeply racist. Assuming someone doesn't speak English <laughs> is a form of racism. It's not the racism that we think of when you say the word, because it's not, it's not violent, it's not... Well, yeah, anyway, you know what, you know what racism is. No, but I mean, yeah, like, yeah like, of course, but I, I get your point actually. That it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's sort of like, of course, not that dramatic yeah. level of racism, but it still belongs to racism mm -hmm. because you're separating in that case or categorizing. Yes, and, and it's those assumptions that you make that are based on this or mm -hmm. like, just using racism as an example, but uh, assumptions they're not. They might be, and again, on a, on a one hand, again, individual these things yeah. might not seem like a big deal, but it's those assumptions you make on a daily basis and that shape your behaviors because you're in this, you, you have those assumptions because of the society you live in. I don't know how to say it. It's what it's normal has. It might even be perceived as good. <laughs> I'm just thinking of one example where someone told me, yeah. I'm just having a conversation about, I, I don't even know, like, who likes who and crushes people have, and, and one person said, oh, but I could never, like, a Chinese person. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that was racist, how can you say that? It is, though. And to them, yeah, for me it was just so obvious. Uh, Excuse me, what? But they didn't see it that way because they, they were arguing that it's, uh, it's their own personal. You know, they can't they can't help me. They find attractive. They're not. They think about it's feeling that they get, and so they can't control that. And in the moment, that was that was a great example when I was just too upset to do anything about it. I knew that you were going to say that. Three years later, it is. It's the question why you find it so important or not. And the root of that is racism. Well, okay, I never thought about it this way. Huh. Yeah? Well, no. But actually, but isn't that maybe some something like having a taste for music, you know? I love right. tech, uh, you don't love tech, he doesn't love tech, uh, he loves country, uh, he loves hip hop, uh, it's like this when you feel the vibe, and you can feel the vibe in terms of the friends. Who can I? I don't know. Yeah, different people. I don't know, can I say it like this? No. Not racist, no, 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 but in, 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 no, in, 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 in the context of just feeling a sex oh, attraction or attraction in general. Uh, yeah, oh, so could that be like based just on vibe? Like, of course, I cannot generalize. I, I, can, I, I bet, yeah. I really bet, it doesn't matter how specific your perception of your uh, dream woman or dream man is, and I'm never gonna, whatever, marry a Chinese woman. There's still at least one person that is Chinese that you're gonna feel sexually attracted to. Millions of people saying, I will never find any of them attractive. Why? And of course, I'm in pictures that they're Chinese. <laughs> Who I categorize as a liar racist. In this case, racist because like, people of color are marginalized or oppressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, what I'm trying to say is like, if you fuck, fuck, fuck. You know, it's like. like you can, you can say you I cannot have, generalize. I've never liked a Chinese person before. Yeah. Sure, that's your own story, your own history, your own experience. That's uh, absolutely yeah. true. But that doesn't mean you will never one day be exactly, yeah. attracted to someone of Chinese descent. Which is, yeah. I, I, no, 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 I don't, no, no, I, I really, I would put the signature under your statement totally, like 100%. Um, hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I forget why we decided to leave. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Because of my first assumption in terms of things like this racism, what everybody thinks about when you talk about racism is lack of love, I would say, sometimes. But in terms of this micro racist thing, it's like not lack of love, or maybe yes, I don't know, like, 
can we no, we can kind of generalize it. It's just like again, That's once really again. what it comes down to. You just can't generalize yeah. based on race. Okay. Yeah, you can. Because everyone, yeah, it's just really a, different. Plus, the the racism part comes in that oftentimes those assumptions, but not assumptions, but those, the, those feelings that you get. The reason you find certain people attractive is because the society you grew up in, we're told what is people are like. Exactly, yeah. And unfortunately, in so many societies, almost everyone is being colonized and told that fair skin, fair features, you know, a very European looking face, that's what's beautiful. And so, that's the most racist assumption. I don't, I just don't find that flat nose is attractive. That's because of a racist society that you grew up in, not because they're not attractive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I, I can imagine that I, I know a bunch of people who would not agree with you or with me in that case well because I, I agree with you. But yeah, that's like just this thing, this microaggression slash racist thing that we're gonna talk about or that we are talking about. And, oh man. Um, so. For everybody who's watching and listening, uh, like, I can, I can really, really, I appreciate your fucking patience if you listen and watch it until now, because we have some noises in the background, people talking all the time, jet ski, whatever, fruits, vegetables, vendors, da 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 and... <laughs> No, for real, like, uh, <laughs> do it. Um, but still, I hope that we could have just, that we somehow open the mind of one person who just listened in terms of racism or whatever. I'm still, I never, I've never been thinking that in detail regarding this topic, but this definitely, you, you just, you just seeded something in my mind that I'm gonna be aware of certain patterns when I'm talking to people or just when I'm aware of whatever, like, man, it's like so omniscient, no, not omniscient, how do you say, omnipresent, yeah. ubiquitous, ubiquitous, right? can I say that, whatever, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's the work of just always kind of, I guess always questioning why you think a certain way, which is also something you try to practice, it. and it's hard, when you, it's just your own feeling, your, your own voice inside your head, but sometimes, that's what that's what brings about change. It's just questioning, questioning everything, always. But not over questioning and over thinking. Not over thinking. Yeah. Not thinking the same thing over and over and over again. But you can question. question. Yeah, of course, because yeah, because you're never gonna get to an absolute conclusion. You can just question, question, get all the wiser, and still acknowledge that I don't almost that I almost don't know nothing. Yeah. Well, no one knows anything. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Of course. That sums up my. Entire school career. I don't know. The problem. But like, Socrates? Do you say Socrates in English? Socrates. Yeah, it's Socrates. He said, like, I know that I don't know nothing. And that's like. And, and I um, one was that, like, one and a half years ago, I met with my former math, mathematics teacher from university in 78. And because I was just curious about his mindset, because when I was a student, I didn't give a fuck at all. And I was like reflecting a little bit, and wow, this guy is actually pretty intelligent. Like, let's just text him an email, like if you want to meet up. Like, it was really weird, but really dope. And he drove, like, he rode by train to my city, and we were spending six hours to get in a cafe, just talking to each other. And he said it as well. Like, and he's like pretty wise. And you, you, you don't know shit. Like, you can assume you have like different, uh, how do you say, yeah, assumptions regarding this and that, but you can never say that you know this. Of course, I can say that you have. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, but that's it. You, you know, that's the normal thing. But yeah. the, the thing that you know something about a human being, whatever yeah. behavioral patterns, and da, 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 it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so complicated. And that's like what makes human beings in general like a little bit stupid because they're making things just too complicated. Although they're just easy, or although they should not just be. Although they could be easy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. We love thinking. I guess. <laughs> We should go to an ant and eat something. Yeah. Food? Always. I'm gonna come. Once again, thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you that you're here. And maybe one random fact. Fuck, I know, my brain is off. 
I want to eat something. My favorite fun fact. Yeah. Sometimes sloths move so slowly and they're so silly. They'll grab their own arms instead of a branch uh -huh. and pull out the tree. <laughs> it's adorable. Fair enough. Thank you for sharing this valuable. Yep. Now you know. Wise thing. I don't know. <laughs>